Good morning and a warm welcome to the latest service from the Aberdeen West Churches. My name is Keith Blackwood, the Minister of Manifield, and together with my colleagues John and Shuna and Kenneth and Lorreen, we've been providing worship over this period of lockdown. Over the last two weeks, of course, we have enjoyed the services provided by the Reverend Dr Martin Fair, the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. And I know that you will have enjoyed being part of these services that so many of the churches and congregations throughout Scotland have been enjoying in these last weeks. Today, I would also like to introduce you to a new member of the team. Amy Bender is joining me at Manifield as part of her final placement in her training as a candidate as a Church of Scotland minister. And it'll be wonderful for us to have Amy joining us for the next 12 months. And I no doubt many in the congregation of Manifield and indeed the wider cluster group will enjoy the opportunity to get to know Amy. And uh, we wish her well in this final part of her training. Today, we remember a time when we were able to meet in our buildings, when we were able to share fellowship with others in a physical space. We remember a time when Jesus gathered crowds around them and these crowds gathered in fellowship with one another and were fed by the spiritual nourishment of Jesus himself. Today, we remember that story and as we gather, know that each solitary individual who watches this service, who is part of this service, is gathered together in a noisy throng of a family, a congregation of God's people, worshipping in our homes, worshipping wherever we are, but united in Christ. Let us join together in the singing of our first hymn, Let Us Worship God.
let's come to God in prayer now. Let us pray. Living God, we praise your name. At the dawn of a new day, we praise your name. When you people gather together for worship, we praise your name, even though at this time we are not physically gathering together. When we open our eyes and see the wonder of your creation, Lord, we praise your name. When we open our hearts to the wonder of your love, your love for each and every one of us, Lord, we praise your name. When we consider the birth, life, death and the rising again of Jesus, your Son, our Saviour, Lord, we truly praise your glorious name. So we come today, God, for this time of online worship together with gratitude in our hearts, gratitude at the very core of our being for all that you have done for each and every one of us. We come with blessings on our lips and we come to praise your wonderful name. But Lord, some of us are cast down by a sense of failure. Some of us are oppressed by a sense that we are inadequate, a sense that we've failed you. Some of us are deeply conscious of past sins that haunt us. So Lord, we need to hear again your promise of forgiveness. The promise that you gave to our forefathers, previous followers from the past, down the centuries. Because you promised them that you would free them from all that weighs them down. You promised them that through your covenant, they would find a relationship based on love and understanding. And you promise us through the dying of Jesus on the cross, through his resurrection, that our sins are truly forgiven. And so, Lord, our loving Father, hear our pleas for forgiveness and hear us as we thank you for salvation and security, for hope and holiness, for discovery and new directions and new beginnings. For all of this, Lord, we praise your name this day. Heavenly Father, we pray that you might straighten the crooked paths in our lives, that we might walk boldly and honestly in the way of Jesus. Level the rocky ground that we might follow in his glorious way. For we ask all of this in his name, in the name of him who taught us when we pray together to say the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever. Amen. Mitchell and Stuart came to visit me as I was having my lunch today. They were very excited. They'd been down to see the church and things have changed quite a bit. They wondered where all the chairs had disappeared to and why there were signs up asking people to use sanitizer and wear face coverings. I explained to them that we're getting things ready for when we could get back to using the church for worship. They told me how they tried out various places to sit so they could see what was going on. They still like being at the back of the church best. I explained that things would be very different when we first go back and that not everyone will be able to come. The chairs have been spaced out to keep everyone two metres apart and the signs are to remind people to use the hand sanitizer and to wear face coverings. Things that we are getting used to when we go out shopping and other places. I asked him how they were and was Kirsty's bedroom still comfortable? and they told me they were very comfortable there and keeping out of the way of Scampy the cat. They also said they were a bit tired. Exhausted was the word they used. So I asked them what they'd been up to to make themselves so tired. 
it turns out that they'd been on a long trip and had visited a church on their way home. Because they're so quiet, I hadn't noticed they'd been gone and they hadn't told me they were going, the naughty pair. They had been to Mitchell's great uncle Herbert's funeral and something quite amazing happened when they were there. Not at the funeral itself, but at the gathering afterwards. Mice don't have to follow the same rules for physical spacing that we do. And Mitchell explained what had happened. Lots of mice had travelled for the funeral. Great Uncle Herbert was a very popular mouse and had been head of the family. Their nickname for him was Mouseketeer. They had all been sitting talking and telling favourite stories about Uncle Herbert, like the time he chased a whole group of cats out of his barnyard or the time he single-handedly took on a wild ginger tomcat and outwitted and outran him, and got the fat tomcat stuck in between two friends posters. Oh, how they had laughed and cried at the stories of his bravery and honour, and his funny little sayings. But everyone there had started to get hungry. They had not planned to be there so long, and so there was no food to eat, or at least not enough for everyone. So Mitchell had a little bit of cheese in his bag and shared it and someone else had some sweets, and another a broken biscuit, and so on, until everyone got something and no one went home hungry. I smiled at Mitchell when he told me this. I explained that that reminded me of a story in the Bible. I asked if they would like to hear the story, and so they snuggled in and I told them it. Jesus had been very busy and wanted to take some time out, so he and his disciples took a boat to the other side of the lake. But people saw them leaving and ran ahead along the shore and met them as they landed. A huge crowd greeted them as they stepped from the boat. And Jesus felt sorry for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus sat down with his disciples and began to teach the vast crowd that had gathered. Late in the afternoon, the disciples came to Jesus and said, It's getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy food. But Jesus said, you feed them. With what? Philip asked. It would take a small fortune to buy food for all these people. How much food do you have? Jesus asked. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But how could that possibly feed this huge crowd? Tell the boy to bring me the loaves and fish, Jesus said. Then he told the disciples to get everyone to sit down. And with that, Jesus began to share out the bread and fish, and suddenly everyone had enough to eat. So much so that there were 12 baskets of food left over. Mitchell, I asked him, I wonder if the people did what you and your family did and shared what they had with them, and that the miracle was the willingness of people to share with each other. Lots of little bits of food adding up to lots and lots of food. Mitchell thought that sounded like something that Jesus would like. That we should share what we have and that way everyone would have enough. It's not a bad lesson, is it? I then noticed Mitchell and Stuart eyeing up my toasted sandwich. And yes, I did share it with them. Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. Jesus feeds the 5,000. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said, 
and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve baskets of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about five thousand men, besides women and children. Picnics are a part of summer. Packing up the picnic hamper with lots of delicious food and drink. The anticipation of a trip in the car, of finding the ideal picnic spot, of hopefully basking in the warmth of summer sun as we enjoy the delicacies and the company of family and friends. Perhaps, like us, your picnics when on holiday have been bought from local shops, stopping to look around a market town, to view the food on offer at an outdoor market or in the local delicatessen, fruited or baker, buying locally produced cheese, meat and patty, locally baked bread, a fine cake and a selection of fruit, and then carrying on with your journey to a local beauty spot. One such picnic that springs to mind was in North Yorkshire, stopping in Thirsk to buy all the delicacies that we thought we would like, and then going on to the White Horse at Sutton Bank to enjoy our goodies. You may have memories of picnics at a favourite family picnic spot. For our family, it was Dunkeld, where we often went with cousins for picnics. The joke in the family was that my dad's car went on automatic pilot to Dunkeld as soon as he got into it. The grandchildren always knew that if granny and granddad said, come on, let's go for a run in the car and a picnic, they would inevitably end up in Dunkeld, nestled among the hills by the banks of the River Tay. I wonder what memories the people in the crowd gathered on a hillside overlooking the Sea of Galilee had of the meal of the picnic they shared with Jesus one evening. But before we join them for the picnic, let's put the story of the feeding of the 5,000 into its context within the Gospel. At the beginning of the story, we learn that Jesus has received some news that caused him to seek a place where he could be alone. He needed time out to process what had happened, something with which I'm sure many of us will be familiar. For we've all faced situations, received news, found ourselves emotionally in a place where we need to take a step back, to reflect, to pray, to be still, and not to have people bother us. That was where Jesus found himself when he received the news that his cousin and co-worker John had been killed. As a family member, John had been there throughout Jesus' life. Then at the beginning of his ministry, it was to John he went for baptism. And it was John who recognised him as the one who was to come, the one whose sandals he was unworthy to tie. Now John was dead, killed on the orders of Herod as entertainment at his birthday party. Jesus needed time to reflect on what had happened. John's death was a warning of what lay ahead of him as the cross loomed ever larger on the horizon of his life. So he took a boat across the lake to a lonely place, only to discover that the crowd which habitually followed him had beaten him there. However, his reaction wasn't the same as ours. We might, in similar circumstances, having found our quiet spot our place of retreat 
occupied with others felt a sense of annoyance or exasperation at not being able to get that time out that we were looking for. But not Jesus. There was no annoyance. There was no exasperation. He wasn't frustrated or angry. When he saw the crowd, there was only compassion. He had compassion on them and he healed their sick. When Jesus looked at the crowd, when he saw their need, then his own need for solitude, for time to think, to reflect, to mourn, was transformed by love. And in that love, he reaches out to them, no matter his own inner feelings or need. There are many who know the reality of such situations, situations where care is required, where there is need to be met, and no matter what they personally are going through, no matter their own feelings or their own need, they willingly, with no thought to themselves, reach out, caring and loving, despite the sometimes great personal cost involved. There are times when the need to express our love to another can overcome the pain, hurt, stress, sadness which we ourselves are going through. So Jesus reached out in love to those who were in deepest need of the power of his love to transform their lives. And the day wore on until evening was approaching. Then the disciples came to him with their concern that as the day was getting on, the crowd would be hungry. It would be best to send them off to find food in the nearby villages. One wonders whether their concern was wholly altruistic, or were they also tired and hungry at the end of a long day, looking for the crowd to be sent off so they could have rest and have something to eat. Whatever their motives, Jesus turns the tables on them. They don't need to go away, he says. You give them something to eat. He hands the responsibility for feeding the crowd to those who one day will be entrusted with continuing his work in the world. It's now up to them to solve the problem for themselves as one day they will have to solve the problems of their ministry and mission without his physical presence and advice. But the question for them was, how could they do it? How can they feed such a vast crowd when all they have to hand are five loaves and two fish? For Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, the authors of the Gospels, the story of this meal must have been important for all four tell it. Although only John introduces the boy whom Andrew brings to Jesus with his picnic of five small loaves and two small fish. But whether it was the picnic of a boy offered to Jesus, or the meagre food supply of the disciples, the important thing is they take what they have and they bring it to Jesus. He then takes it, gives thanks, blesses, breaks, and then gives the meal to the crowd sitting on the grass. And all are fed. How the miracle is achieved, we don't know. Was it through Jesus' power that these meagre resources were multiplied to become a feast that fed every man, woman and child in the crowd? Or was the miracle, as some commentators suggest, in overcoming human selfishness? That as Jesus began to share what little was available to him, others also began to share. And before they knew it, there was more than enough for everyone. The miracle of changed hearts, of lives touched by the transforming power of Christ, of selfishness overcome. However we understand the miracle, the truth is that where Christ is, human hearts are changed, lives transformed and the hungry soul is fed. And in this 
miracle story, there's a message of hope for us. A message that our hearts, our lives, our world can be changed by Christ's presence. But our response to this may be the same as the disciples' response to Jesus. We don't have the resources to achieve what you're asking of us. We can't feed this vast crowd with five loaves and two fish. We don't have it in us to change the world, to overcome human selfishness and greed, indifference and division, injustice and hatred. But Jesus says to us, as he did to the disciples, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. You do something about it. I have committed to you the task of continuing my work in the world. You are my fellow workers in building my kingdom on earth. This is a daunting task. But the miracle is Jesus takes the little we have to offer him, the paucity of our resources, and through his spirit at work in us, he can achieve great things. One of my favourite scripture passages is Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, in which he writes at the end of the prayer, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. To him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. Whose power is at work in us. We are Christ's people. In us and through us, his power is at work. In us and through us, he can achieve immeasurably more than we can ever ask or imagine. We live in a world of plenty but one where human selfishness and greed still mean that many go hungry, whilst others waste food. Where many are disadvantaged, while others are careless of the world's resources. Where there are those who can barely scrape a living, while others are unprepared to share of the much they have with their neighbours. Thinking that the world's problems aren't their problems, that it's for others rather than for them to make the difference. To this, to them, to us, Jesus says, you do something about it. You feed them. And he can take the little we have to offer and through it and us achieve things we never thought possible, things beyond our imagining. I leave you with a thought that I discovered in an anthology of Christian writings. It's an anthology of hope which was compiled by Campbell Stephen. And these words are those of the 20th century British theologian John Stott. The Christian sees the need and he has the wherewithal to meet it. He sees sickness and he has medicine and medical training. He sees ignorance and he has knowledge. He sees hunger and he has food. He sees poverty and he has money. He sees lack of technical know-how and he has technical skills. The simple question is whether we relate what we have to what we see. Amen.
God, our loving creator, we are grateful for all the ways that you have blessed us, for all the ways that we have experienced the abundance of your resources. We've experienced the abundance and kindness of one another. And yet we come before you this day with heavy hearts as well, mindful that there are those among us and those throughout the world who are overwhelmed with fear, a loss of hope, a sense of isolation, and perhaps a deep sense of anger. We pray for our brothers and sisters who have been profoundly impacted by COVID-19, for the loss of life and those who grieve, for those who are experiencing the impact, physical impact of COVID-19 as they seek to recover. We pray for all those care providers, whether it be in the hospital, the care homes, whether it be care providers who come into the home and those family members that provide care in the home. We pray for all those who are waiting, waiting to have their own health issues addressed, who've put, been put on hold as a result of this crisis. We pray for their well-being. We pray that indeed they might be able to access the health care that they need. We pray for a sense of peace for each person. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are experiencing poverty, who are overwhelmed by no place to call home, no food to, to eat or to serve their families, who are overwhelmed with the poverty and lack of resources. And we pray for those who are experiencing the poverty of spirit. Indeed, O oh God, grant them your vision, your mercy, and your love. We are mindful of brothers and sisters throughout the world and within our own communities who are experiencing violence, whether it be within the home, whether it be on the border, in our own cities, we pray for your peace, O oh God. We pray for those who are experiencing discrimination, whether it be the color of their skin, their ethnic origin, their gender, their sexual orientation, their perceived mental health or social status. Whatever the barrier that causes people to be treated differently. We pray that give us the eyes to see that we are all created in your image. Each person here on this earth, that we are created in your image and help us to stand up for justice, to create communities where each person, every person among us, and those who are waiting to come to be among us and those out in our community are celebrated and honored for the person that you have created them to be. Healing God, we pray for your mercy and love for those that are near and dear to our hearts. So in this brief silence, hear us as we name those loved ones. Empowering God, continue to inspire us with a sense of compassion, with a sense of mercy and love. Inspire our leaders to lead out of justice and compassion. We pray for our world. We pray for our churches. Give us the vision to live into what you are calling us to be about. 
We are not going back to church, yet we are living into this new way of being. Whether it is virtually, in community, within a building, you are calling us to be transformed and to transcend all, all ways of previous understanding. So help us, enable us to live into this reality. Calm our fears, grant our leaders wisdom as we seek to make our way forward. God, we pray that you would grant to each one of us a spirit of generosity, a generosity of sharing our resources, a generosity of spirit that we might share the love and the mercy and the peace that you give, grant each one of us. We are grateful for this day. We are grateful for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Help us to share that with one another so that indeed we are the body of Christ. And now hear us as we sing together hymn number 231, For the Fruits of All Creation. It has been good worshiping with you this day. Thank you to all who have participated in making this worship service possible. Please join us again next Sunday in the usual manner. Let's pray together as we close. Lord, you are there for us. When our lives are parched and hungry, anxious and weary, direct us to you the source of our holy food. Reveal yourself to us as the giver of all that we need, physically and spiritually. You give of yourself generously for us and for all people. Amen. Knowing God's presence and generosity, go in the peace of God, restored and renewed, and may God hold you in close embrace until we meet again.